Hello guys, welcome back to Rodas Meca, it's Marco here, and today I'll show you my way to paint clean colorful models. I love to paint gritty anti-heroes, often putting the accent on the heavy weathering coming from a lifetime or a truly bad day on the battlefield, but there are figures that simply need to be neat and bright. The guys of Sinium Games sent me a batch of their new models for the game Legends of Sinium, and I decided to fully embrace the clean, cartoony look of their concept art, using powerful colors, smooth blendings and an illustrational rendering of volumes, textures and materials. I strongly believe that a good painter should be able to adapt his hand to any kind of style, that's why I constantly jump between different models, techniques and materials, carefully avoiding the subtle traps of the comfort zone. When I paint a model my objective is always to tell a story, and different stories need a different rhythm, language and vocabulary, so don't waste time and energy looking for THE unifying style, and focus your effort in creating the best version of the single specific stories you want to tell. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button to always know what happens on the channel, and if you want to support my work, like, comment, share, watch another video, and maybe check my Patreon page, where you can find the real-time footage of my videos, with every single little line and brushstroke. Thanks a million, guys! With this paint job I want also to prove that the style and the look of a model is totally independent of the tools and paints you use, so in the next video I'm going to paint an equally clean, vibrant model, but using a different approach, techniques and materials, to show how little they really mean in the final picture. All this stuff is just a mean to an end, and people are looking at your models don't care about the process, or if you use the oils, acrylics or spray cans, the result is the only thing that really matters, because that's the only thing they are able to see. Keeping this in mind, I start my models only when I know precisely how I want them to look like, and all the details of the story I want to tell. I want to create a bright scene for a character inspired by Disney's Robin Hood, set in the fresh shade of a lush forest, with a warm sun filtered by the roof of leaves. From here I mentally move backwards step by step, understanding what I need to obtain the result, and only at this point deciding the physical ways that I'll use to fix that sensation on the model. Here I start knowing that I want luminous, vibrant colors everywhere, so I make this aspect a priority from the very beginning. The best way to boost the internal luminosity of a color is to layer it on top of a source of high values, able to provide that extra light. So my starting point is a simple general grey scale, but extremely unbalanced towards pure white. It's subtle, but if you are a veteran of the channel, you can clearly see how this is very different from my usual sketching, that I tend to focus on setting the volumes of the model, through the use of high and often extreme contrasts. I consciously accept to lose a lot of information about shapes and volumes in this softer and less dramatic flow of lights and shadows, to boost the visual output of the colors I add on top. I still apply this general high value with its relative light grey scale, instead of working directly on a simple layer of white primer, because even if with a weaker contribute, it still delivers a useful sense of the main volumes, that I can use as a map to apply dark saturated colors in the shadows. The role and importance of base colors, or if you want to be more technical, mid-tones, is extremely overrated. The first layer of color on any part of the model is only a stepping stone for the dynamic flow of shadows and lights, and in a model with a good contrast between deep shadows and extreme highlights, the base color is just a microscopic point inside the progression of the final blend, so I don't need it to be extremely precise or uniform, saturated or opaque, I just need a bit of color to start building a simple backbone for the scheme. I use semi-opaque paints in this stage to be able to see the soft sketch in transparency, letting the luminosity of my white to filter through these layers. All the tones are extremely vibrant and saturated inside the bottle, but you can see that I'm not looking for that kind of final saturation and opacity right now, because that will be a job for lights and shadows with their extra new tones. 
I could do the same with inks, contrast paints, or any other kind of paint, adjusting fluidity and transparency with basic dilution, and this is valid both for airbrushing and classic brushwork. Here I'm using a gold and high flow acrylics, just because I have the perfect tones for the scheme I have in mind, and they are ready to use in the airbrush straight from the bottle, but it's just a matter of saving a few minutes of work, and for sure, not the kind of choice that makes the paint job. This is what I consider a good base for the more serious part of the work. I have a rough sensation of the scheme, and its uh, basic components, but lights and shadows are still uh, blank spaces, ready to absorb new tones and values, interacting with a base that easily accepts and integrates new use. I shade the orange fur first with a deep, transparent red. Then with a warm and more opaque magenta. Similar idea for the armor, where I deepen its tone first with a transparent dark grey, then with a more opaque and cold turquoise, to fix stronger shadows following the map of the sketch. Fur and armor are the only elements where I use two tones to create the basic shadows. This because of their larger surfaces, that need a wider and more progressive modulation, and part because of their prominent role in the sculpt and scheme, that needs uh, more visual complexity and extra interesting details. And the green is shaded with a simple, transparent, cold green. The scheme is starting to take a proper shape. My base tones are all uh, quite warm and all my shadows tend to cold use, to simulate the refreshing shadows of the lush forest. What I need now is to introduce the warm sensation of the yellow light of the sun, and I do it imitating the natural behavior of this kind of light, using a transparent filter of yellow ink on top of everything. It can seem an oversimplification, but that's more or less how a powerful chromatic light works in real life. Every element of the scheme has its own native color, coming from the material it's made of, but the tones of lights and shadows depend mostly by external factors, interacting and bouncing on those materials, and lights in particular tend to absorb a lot of the tone of the environmental light. Using a transparent application from above, I'm able to influence all the existing tones thanks to their optical mix, without creating an obvious yellow layer, but making everything more vibrant and saturated with environmental inputs, and with a clear chromatic direction towards yellow and warmer tones. Again, that's why I left the mid-tones so light and undefined, so I can fill them with new information and sensations. I fix the white that I want extremely clean and pure, and the general color sketch on top of the value sketch is done. I uniform all the various finishes under a thin layer of matte varnish. Some of the transparent paints I used are quite glossy, and since the next stages will have a super coherent finish, that will be the final finish of the model, it's better to fix the issue now. I close this stage priming the non-metallic gold trims with contrast agarose dunes. And fixing the white overspray on the muzzle with contrast griffoned orange. Again, all the different paints are totally interchangeable. <laughs> and I move to oil paints for the rest of the work. Again, this is a choice more based on my mood of the moment, and a personal preference for a medium that I'm simply enjoying a lot in this period, instead of some kind of proper technical or practical need. I use a small set of cold, transparent tones to create light filters for the major elements of the sculpt. The bluish paints grey for the armor, the dark green of perilin black for the outfit, magenta for the fur, 
and a mix of black, amber, amber for gold and wood, because I don't have a proper dark brown in my collection. This is not an oil priming, because I don't need that kind of a receptive surface to work only on the small blends of light mid-tones and extreme lights, and it's not even the kind of wash I usually use uh, to catch geometric details and panel lines, because uh, this model doesn't have that kind of sharp elements easy to catch. I use these tones as proper filters, mostly to kill every residue and visual artifact of the airbrushed layer. You can see from the extreme transparency of this application that I'm not looking for a meaningful chromatic impact on the surface. My main objective is to smooth out the finish of the fast and furious airbrushing of the first stage with few unifying tones. And I remove visible brush strokes, pools and excesses of paint with a gentle pass of a makeup sponge. This is absolutely not a speed painting video, and I really took my time in the second upcoming part, but I'm really proud to say that the work until this point took less than 2 hours. Speed is never the point, but if I can save time during the boring foundational steps and invest more attention, physical and creative energy on the more artistic and meaningful steps, well, why not? Here I'm working on lights, textures and details, so the palette is made only by vibrant, saturated and opaque tones, able to create solid layers on top of the sketch. And I use uh, two colors for every major element of the scheme, choosing a colder and a warmer version of the same hue to be able to work around the mid-tones, both in the colder spectrum of the shadows and the warmer range of the lights. Again, the base colors are not important, and all my thinking goes to how they develop on the volumes of the sculpt. But as I'll explain better later, there's even more involved in this choice of tones. I constantly suggest you to mix your colors, and train your mixing skills, and at this point you are used to my messy palettes, so what I'll tell you now can be a bit shocking or counterintuitive, but here is the final secret to create bright, vibrant models. You have to keep mixing to a minimum, or even not mixing anything at all. Every time you mix something into an original color, you are physically and chemically reducing its original concentration of pigments, weakening its vibrancy and visual impact. For this reason, I have on the palette only powerful saturated tones, and I use them pure, or with just a pinch of the tone next to them, that being the same color with just a little difference in temperature doesn't mess too much with the saturation. The high opacity of these colors is another key aspect, because it prevents optical mixes with the previous layers, so I'm sure that the color I fix on the surface, even if stretched and blended to an extreme, still maintains most of its impact. I use the exact same mindset working with acrylics, and actually I'm even more careful with them, because even the most opaque acrylic can easily become transparent with simple dilution, so in the context of a work like this one, I would have used heavy body acrylics, like a Scale 75 Artist or Chimera, with just a tiny bit of water inside to control better the brush strokes, but keeping all their strong opacity and covering power. If you followed my deep dive into oil paints of the last couple of months, you know that the work from this point becomes really straightforward. Thanks to the acrylic sketch, my major, large, volumetric blends are all in place, so I need to use only microscopic quantities of paint for small, contained blends, easy to set and control with a basic flow of application of thick, almost undiluted paint and its blend with a clean, dry, soft brush.
The technical part of the workflow is all made by these uh, two simple steps, repeated over and over. So, the most uh, interesting aspect of this stage of the work is what I have and happens on the palette, and the different kinds of brush strokes that I use uh, to bring paint to the model. Because of this opacity and the high definition that uh, this layer is meant to create, the brush strokes I use are all extremely meaningful, even where I end up blending them more aggressively. On the tails I use uh, large fluid brush strokes to give the idea of the flowing undefined mass of air and the kinetic energy of this jump and similar but more concentrated and less blended brush strokes on the fur of the muzzle to give the idea of finer air and smaller strands of fur and to focus your attention on a more defined area. Short lines and dots on the green outfit to create the texture of the fabric and heavily blended large blocks of lights on the non-metallic gold to create the illusion of a shiny, polished material. Every brush stroke has a meaning and a function, and it's defined and controlled both by how it's applied and how heavily it's blended. Working with a high coverage, heavy body and long drying time of oil paints, hedge highlights and uh, small details become the easiest part of the whole paint job. And since I'm sure a lot of you will ask about the orange flowers on the base, here is a super quick tutorial inside the tutorial. The mix is the same I used to make snow effects, and you can check the recipe in the link to a very old video up here. I simply add a good amount of acrylic paint in the mix, and I use the tangent movement of a big brush to apply it on the tips of the grass tufts. The surface tension of the PVA glue creates by itself the globular formations on the tip of the single strands. The mix dries in few minutes, and then you can even apply lights and shadows to make the flowers more interesting and better integrated with the model and its lights. And here is the final result. I hope you like this uh, change of style and the implications of me using a workflow that I used for several darker models, but in a context of clean illustrational painting. I constantly receive questions from painters that try to replicate recipes and workflows down to the single brush stroke, thinking that's the only way to obtain a certain result. But there's always more than one way to skin a cat, and your ability to adapt to new styles doesn't come from tools, paints and steps, but from your knowledge of their properties and behaviors, and I'm going to prove it even more in the next video. So stay tuned, and in the meantime, start testing your skills on a new video visual style and uh, see how it goes. If you like this video, give it a like and subscribe. Remember that you can ask me anything down below with a comment and you can follow my projects during the week using one of my socials. And if you want to support my work, check my Patreon page and join the community or maybe ask for a commission. See you next week guys!